Hey guys, what's going on? This is the Dream It Alive show. I'm your host, Ash Kumra, co-founder of DreamItAlive.com. Today's guest, who we're going to have in a little bit, is Wing Lam, co-founder of Wahoo Fish Tacos. It's a thriving restaurant chain that has leveraged what I call the action sports lifestyle. And they've created more than 60 restaurants in four states across the country. It's a pretty amazing feat what he's done. He's a self-made entrepreneur, and his story is really compelling because um, he's one of the biggest pay-it-forward individuals that you will probably ever come upon. And I feel that his success as an entrepreneur, the more he becomes successful, the more he seems to give back. Uh, Most recently, he was on the ABC Secret Millionaire show, and he actually helped give out over a million dollars in resources to the greater area of Mobile, Alabama. He also supports many local and national community-based events and nonprofit organizations, such as Share Our Strength, Orangewood Children's Foundation, and the Surf Rider Foundation. So without further ado, we got Wing Lam. How you doing, bro? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> hey, no problem, Wing. So I always ask our guests this question. Give us the five-minute overview of your of your journey, how you got to launching Wahoos. Well, you know, as I tell everybody, you know, we Hello. always look, we always think the grass is greener on Hello. the other side, but it's really not. Hello. It's just a different shade of green, I tell people. But the problem is, you know, most people today, if you're not happy okay. with what you're doing, figure out what will make you happy, but also make sure you have the skill sets to make, you know, to accomplish what you think you're going to try to do next. And at a, you know, early age, at around the age of 25, after, you know, giving a corporate America spin, I kind of realized within a few years that it wasn't exactly my cup of tea, you know, like working for the man. So I decided, you know, say, hey, what else can I do using the skill sets that I kind of have? And one of the things that I realized, you know, from a kid on to college, that I always had a really good knack for food and beverage, restaurants in particular, and events, because my parents have had restaurants all over the world. So I talked to my, you know, two younger brothers and say, hey, dude, I know you guys are all in college. You were getting ready to get out. And Ed and Mingo, uh, you know, I gave it the good old boys try in the corporate, and I don't think it's all that's supposed to be. I think we may have a better chance of doing something that we really love, and we're all pretty good with food and beverage. And we get, we wanted to have a twist, so we thought, hey, Let's not do the Chinese food gig because that's already been done, but let's try to do something different. And we talked about what we missed, what we liked, and what wasn't being offered in Orange County at the time in 1988. And we looked around because you know what? Nobody has a great fish taco place to hang out at in Orange County. So we kind of pulled from all of our experiences, uh, basically rode on the backside of a you know a napkin a couple of different recipes, and before you knew it, we had this crazy idea we would have a surf theme fish taco place to open, and Ed and I and Mingo kind of got together, borrowed about thirty grand from my parents, uh, used a lot of sweat and uh, you know what I call manual labor to you know take o- take down an old pizza place and convert it into what we now know as the original Wahoos on Placentia Avenue in Costa Mesa. Well, that's a, that's a fascinating story, and there's so many nuggets of wisdom you can learn from that. One is, um, you know, you bluntly said, you know, corporate jobs was not the thing for me. What kind of, what, what do you think is, why do you think it wasn't for you? Could you dive a little further into that? Well, because, you know, one of the things that corporate America, you know, for me anyway, if you're kind of a creative type, uh, they don't really like to hear ideas from somebody who just graduated from college because the old saying is, what do you know? You're still wet behind the ears, right? You're a newbie. So it's like, you know, being in high school and trying to, you know, listen to a freshman to be the class president for the whole high school. Well, you know, you're a freshman. What do you know, right? So the idea is in corporate America, it's almost the same mentality. They don't want to hear from somebody who's just graduated from college. They'd rather hear from somebody who's either, you know, been there for 5, 10, 20 years. The problem is, you know, it just doesn't feel like, you know, they, they want to hear anything fresh, anything, because this is the way it's been done. So it's kind of like, you know, going up against the establishment. It's very difficult, and they're not really embracing the idea that here you just got out of college, we might have some fresh ideas. And they're like, you know what? Keep it to yourselves. We're not really that interested. We've been here 5, 20, 30 years, and we know what we're doing. So it's kind of like, you know, it is a job. I mean, it pays well, but there's really no creativity involved. Yeah, no, I hear you on that. I hear you on that. I was just curious because, 
you know, some of the I've already gotten and we're going to dive into the questions from our viewers in a little bit. But one of the questions I already got is how do you know when it's the right time to leave or not? So actually, let me just jump into that question. When is the right time to leave to create your dream creative job? Well, it's not there's never a right time. But the thing is, the longer you wait, I think the more frustrated you become and the more, uh, what I call it, doubt you may have. Because at the end of the day, if you've got a crazy idea and people basically say, God, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, chances are that is the best idea. So there's never a perfect time. It's just a matter of making the best of what you have. And I you know they, they do have the, you know, the same timing as everything, but you really, you, you just got to, you know, spend less time dwelling in, with the what ifs and what should have and whatever, and just do it, right? But make sure, like I said, you have the skill set and the resources to, you know, actually launch what you're about to do and make sure that, again, everything matches your dreams because, a lot of great ideas on paper never pencil out because you haven't really thought of everything and uh, you don't have the skill sets or the resources to actually execute it. How do you stay grounded? And I know I'm jumping a little forward on your business operations, but how do you stay grounded or how do you, how do you accomplish your goals? Do you use any goal setting tools? Do you do any you know, vision documents? Like, how do you, how do you <laughs> stay grounded? I'm just kind of curious. You can't just say, oh, I surf every day and I go with the flow. I mean, I really want to know nah. what is the mindset of how do you, how do you work nuts and bolts wise to make the revenues and profits and all that stuff and, and customers, of course. Well, you know, you got to have, like I said, the resources to do everything. So I may be the guy reaching for the sky, but thank God for my little brother Mingo and Ed, whatever, and Steve, the other partners, that they're more grounded. So they have their they have all the metrics we got to hit every day, all the covenants, everything that, you know, the banks, the attorneys, the franchises. There's a lot of stuff that are called, it's the, the you know, the backbone of the business, right? So we do, we got to have all the metrics. Everything, you know, it's got to be, you know, the percentages, the goals, everything is there. So we got to make sure that we hit them all every day. But at the same time is uh, people don't necessarily work because, you know, like what I say for the man, just like what I did when I was in corporate America, is I try to be a little more fun, a little more innovative, and give people what I call more aspiration kind of goals. Because yes, you want to make ten percent to the bottom line. You you want to hit your food cost of twenty something percent. You want to do this with your labor costs. But those aren't things that necessarily excite people. But if you give people, you know, the idea that goes, hey, we're going to do this event, hey, we're going to do this kind of a campaign, gives them something else for people to use their creativity. Because at the end of the day, hitting numbers and hitting the metrics is not very creative. It's just a job. So I try to make it a little, you know, bit of a fun in hitting those goals. And that's what I try to bring to the business is more of the fun aspect of the fact that it is a grind. Making fish tacos day in and day out, it's a job. Okay, okay. That's 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 awesome. Now let's ha- let's talk about the fun stuff. Um, I mean, Wing, I, you. I mean, you're one of the most humbled, uber successful entrepreneurs I know, and I know more people than God who can vouch that you have helped shape what is called the action sports lifestyle movement. Um, you know, it, how did you see this opportunity early on, and how did you use this to help grow Wahoos? Well, an interesting thing is I went to school with a lot of kids or new kids from the neighborhood in the 80s that were in the industry. I was never, quote, unquote, good enough to be in the industry, but I figured, you know what, if I can be, you know, co- coexist with them and maybe add some value to it and make everything a little bit more fun. So I kind of made my mission in life to say, hey, if we can take – the surf industry that's already going and make it a little bit better. What can we add to it? And one of the things that was missing from the action sports industry at the time was uh, the, the uh, hospitality component. Because if you came to a surf event, a snowboard event, a skateboard event, there wasn't anything there. It was just a bunch of guys hanging out. You have sponsors, but there wasn't this hospitality. By creating the hospitality component, it kind of started attracting bigger sponsors. And it, there was a place to hang out bef- between before and after the events. So that's what I tried to do early on. And the reason I chose it because, one, it was very inexpensive because there wasn't the X Games around back in the 80s yet. So corporate America wasn't really interested in it because there wasn't that much media coverage. So it was, one, it was inexpensive. Two, it happens to be in a circle of friends that I knew. 
So it was a combination of both. And as the industry grew, I just kind of tagged along and grew with it. Obviously, there's been a lot of big companies like Targets of the World have jumped in ever since. But, you know, I was there early on when really corporate America was interested in it. And I kind of rode the wave. And now today you take these $5 million companies from the 80s and they're multinationals, worldwide companies. And, you know, obviously a lot of people are paying attention to it now. But in the early 80s, nobody really cared about it. Now, when you first started off with Wahoos and you were looking at this projected value of how big the action sports world can be, did you visualize like, like you know, where Wahoos will be after you grow the business, or did you visualize how big this industry can be? Because you got, I get it, you got, you have a foresight on, you saw opportunity. I get what you're saying about the lack of food and beverages and other things that could help action sports people and athletes. But I mean, do you, do you ever visualize how big this could be? Because it's now really big, and you know, you've you've been a part of that process. I, it was, you know, it's funny is, you know, when you don't work for the money part of it, you actually work because you enjoy it, things tend to naturally grow because when other people see you enjoying it, you know, it's that aspiration part again, everybody wants to jump in. So, it, like I said, if anybody were to say in the 40s or 30s, whenever the NFL started, that it would be what it is today, people said, you're crazy. I mean, it's just a bunch of guys playing football on Sunday. Right. Yeah. But as people aspire to be that, you know, then all of a sudden it grows. So you're seeing right now this huge move in the last, you know, decade with soccer, you know, with the U.S. team doing, doing better and better in the World Cup level. So all of a sudden there's this huge, you know, interest in soccer. So where is soccer going to be 30 years from now? If I had to guess if the U.S. keeps doing well, it'll probably be at the same level as an NFL and something like that. But, you know, our is corporate American jumping in at it today? Uh, they're still kind of like tippy-toeing around it. I mean, they'll do it every four years when they're, it's at a World Cup level. But on every, you know, the next three years, they're kind of going, you know what? There's the MSL Cup. There's this. But, you know, there's a few, I mean, great cities where it's really taken a hold. But for the most part, it's kind of still, I call it, at its infancy, infancy stage. So it's, again, one of those things where if you really believe in it, it's a long-term play. So when I look at surfing from 25 years ago, I'm like, if somebody said, hey, it's going to be this, there's going to be X Games and all that, you know, uh, Coca-Cola, some of these other companies should have jumped on way earlier than they did as opposed to when it got expensive. And it's all relative, right? So I took the gamble early on. I took a lot of risk. So I've been embraced and I'm a part of the, the tribe now. But I'm not, you know, saying that not a lot of people took that chance. And it's, again, in every sport, there's going to be opportunities. I mean, I see there's a professional lacrosse league. There's a lot of different things out there. And it's just a matter of which one will rise to the top. And there's a lot of factors, you know, timing, international competition, the Olympics. I mean, there's all kinds of things that will influence it. It's just a matter, again, of being at the right place at the right time. Well, what I love what I'm hearing from you is that um, you're a big, you like to visualize. I mean, you visualize opportunities, you see them. You take mm-hmm. risks, you gamble, throw the dice, and you make it happen. Sure. For Wahoo's success, what do you think the biggest risks that you took where you had visualized it being successful and it actually happened? And it could be anything, anything we're talking about. Well, take, for instance, a lot of what I call the, the bands that were around in the early, you know, late 80s, early 90s. They were basically what I call garage bands. They basically, their claim to fame at that time was basically they were part of the soundtrack for a lot of the videos that the action sports industry used to promote their brands. So basically everybody knew them as local heroes, but they weren't anything bigger than what, you know, we call the industry. So they played a lot of trade shows, a lot of parties, a lot of video premieres, but that was pretty much it. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have one band, let's say, for instance, Blink-182 that just blows up. You have the offsprings of the world, you know. So all of a sudden, that whole movement started. And just like what we did with the surfing apparel guys, we took a chance with these guys. So we were feeding them when nobody else was interested because they're like, who are a bunch of these three punks? Who are these four punks? Whoever they were, right? So now all of a sudden, you're on stage, and these guys are touring the world. So when we talk about we've had spells of great bands, then we kind of ran into where there really weren't any Orange County bands coming out. And then the most recent success we've had is the Dirty Heads. 
same thing. We kind of felt like they matched our demographic, a bunch of, you know, kids from Huntington Beach. All of a sudden, they're touring the world. So when we met them, they were playing what I call small venues. Today, they're headlining major venues. And again, so history has, you know, a way to repeat itself. It's just the timing. So you'll go through stages where there's nobody coming out, and all of a sudden, you got a few. It's just a matter of you being able to spot it and jump in early and be able to add value to their proposition. So we've been now supporting the Dirty Heads for the last five years, and it's been a lot of fun watching them tour the world. And it's, it's, it's really fun to be a part of the journey. That's amazing. Who, you know, you've, you've mentioned a lot of names. And, uh, again, like I mentioned, so many people I know have referenced you as helping them with, uh, you know, by paying it forward and just you mentoring them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Who's like a success story that like you're like really proud of? I mean, you've helped nurture some of these amazing action sports stars and musicians. Like, name a couple that you're just like you always sit back with a smile on your face. And yeah, I'm just curious. Well, I would say that you know when I first got involved with snowboarding over 20 years ago, there was a little kid from San Diego that basically you know his family worked it you know really really hard you know all week long to make sure that his, you know, the kid could compete on the weekends. Uh, his sister competed, his brother. So it was basically three kids competing. And, I mean, again, we tried every which way to help him out, to, you know, to get to the events, uh, you know, uh, help offset the, the cost of, you know, the entry fee, the travel fee. And literally, I mean, the kid was six years old. And you fast forward, you know, 10 years later, you know, the, at the first, you know, snowboard competition to win the Olympics, this kid is winning the gold medal. You know, that's a little Sean White. So when people say to me, he goes, why, think about it, why would anybody bet on a six-year-old football player, baseball player, any, any sport? Think of it. Nobody gets him that early. But the, you had something, there's a quality about Sean early on that you saw, and the only thing you're, you're sitting there saying, hey, bar any injury, this kid is head and shoulders above every kid his age and older in terms of his ability. You know, the fact that he had no fear. He was doing things at seven, eight, nine, every age group that he competed in, he was doing things that were just way over everybody else. So by the time he got to the Olympics, it was just a natural. And then for him to repeat again. So you got a two-time gold medalist there that, again, if somebody said, hey, at six years old, I'm going to sponsor this kid and do things with him, people would have said, you're crazy because you'll hear about football, baseball, you know, any other major sport, maybe by their time they're in junior high. I mean, granted, you might have had a Tiger Woods would be very similar, right? But there's very few of those around that you actually get them when they're five or six years old. They have something very unique about them. So in our sport, we've had numerous kids that we saw early on, and not all of them ended up becoming the world champion. But what they did do is they ended up working in the industry. So we have a ton of friends from, you know, basically what I call marketing managers, VPs, sales manager, but they all have one thing in common. We all like to eat and drink after we're done working. So whether you ended up, you know, being a world champion or just working in the warehouse, we all had the same passion. We wanted to surf, we wanted to snowboard, skate, whatever we wanted to do in our day job, whether we were doing it as an athlete or supporting the, you know, industry. At the end of the day, we all, you know, sit back, drink a Pacifico, have a couple of fish tacos. And that's the space that we ended up filling in. I love that. I love that. Um, wh- okay, now we actually are going to jump to some of the audience questions because we have about 10 questions. So I'm going to try to go through all of them. Sure. If it's not. <laughs> um, this is from Jennifer. Hey, Wing, big fan of Wahoo's Fish Tacos. Love seeing you every year at the U.S. Open to surf. Why, what do you think is going to do what do you think it's going to take to take surfing to the next level (laughs) the only problem with surfing is it's it's not that we can't take it to the next level surfing is probably the only sport that we are involved in that you cannot control the conditions so we would love to be able to plan a massive event in huntington beach when the waves are actually better but we can't we're very weather-dependent, you know, condition-dependent. So it's one of those things where 
surfing will always be, I think, uh, until we can actually control the natural conditions, it'll be hard to bring it to what I call it, to a mass, to scale it, right? Like you can plan the Super Bowl, you can plan the World Series, you can't plan this awesome event if there's no waves. So I know there's a lot of talk about artificial and all the stuff where we can actually control the conditions, but I'm not sure when it's ever going to happen or how soon it will happen, right? Because the technology is out there uh, to create waves, to do the artificial reefs and all that. So if we can create this really super cool stadium around this perfect wave and we can actually predict and time it to where we can control when the waves are going to be at its best, now you would see something that's really fun. So when you actually see on TV all the events on the North Shore of Hawaii, there's a big window. There's no exact date. And what you see on TV is perfect. But when you actually get there, there's very few people actually there because it's hard to get to. So, again, it's one of those things where if we can control the conditions. I think we could do a much better uh, job of scaling surfing. That's awesome. This is from Jeff. And Jeff has a question about, Wing, what are your thoughts on all these other fast casual food kind of companies that um, compete with Wahoos? Are you learning from any of them? Well, I think everybody is out there doing a great job in providing what I call much better quality than there used to be. Uh, the only thing that I worry about is, again, is when you're saying – that you are, and again, you, the public needs to realize all this, is just try to figure out what is truly made for you and what's been processed somewhere else and then brought to you and basically reheated for you. And I won't, you know, I said most mom and pops have full kitchens, and you just have to decide as a consumer what's actually being said and claimed and actually being delivered. Uh, I would say that Wahoo's, after all these years, we still have uh, – kitchens in every single restaurant. We don't have a centralized commissary. And we try to prepare almost everything fresh for you in every store every day. Okay. This next, thing, this next question is from Kristen. Hey, Wing, I actually saw you on ABC Secret Millionaire. It was so awesome that you did this. <laughs> Could you tell us about the experience and from, from start to finish, how it all happened? Well, I'll just give you an idea. Most reality shows are somewhat scripted, right? They have basically a message or a storyline. So in their case, is The Secret Millionaire, uh, it's been airing in Europe for a number of years, and then the, they brought it to the U.S. a few years back. And the original uh, company, production company, made it too much like, oh, here's a guy who's very rich and who has no, I guess, reality, no is not in touch with reality and not realize that in his own backyard there is issues with, you know, poverty or something like that. So I didn't really like the original idea, you know, so I kind of turned it down. And then I waited a few more years, and then a good friend of mine, uh, Miles from uh, Dub Magazine, uh, had done something, and I said, wow, this is really cool. And he actually did it in his own backyard up in L.A., so I thought, okay, this is kind of an interesting take. So the, a new production company took over and said, hey, here's what we want to do. We have a lot of guys that really look, you know, the part, you know, they wear a suit, they drive very expensive cars, blah, blah, blah. We want somebody who's more like goofy. I mean, I hate to say the word, or creates a contrast to all these other kinds of CEOs. And that's kind of the space that I fell in because – if you see the show, the season, everybody's a founder of something, but they all live what I call a very luxurious life, where I live what I call a very simple life in Newport. So they wanted the contrast, and then they obviously I couldn't do anything around Southern California or anywhere where I have stores because there aren't that many guys that look like I do, so it'd be kind of hard to hide. So they chose somewhere where they thought for sure I wouldn't know anybody, but I would still have some... I guess, uh, correlation to what I do, which is I think the two uh, big charities they picked were related to food banks and shelters. So there's a little bit of, you know, homelessness involved in there. And they also brought in an individual, uh, the fisherman, because obviously we sell fish tacos. This guy was a crab uh, fisherman. So it was kind of like there was a little bit of a parallel there. And basically it would show me doing something here and then so and have local charities that have very little resources and what they did with it. So it was kind of a very, very interesting, humbling experience. Uh, Michael, the guy who was one of the helpers at one of the food banks, 
he happened to be the same age as I was. We're both 50 at the time this episode was filmed. And one turn of events changed his life from being a husband and, you know, with a couple of kids and having a real job to where he got into a car accident and lost his car. And by losing his car, he had no way of getting to work. And overnight, he became homeless. So you're talking about like one of those, you know, you talk about that movie that we had years ago called Crash. So it's a sequence of bad turns of events can turn anybody that's one day perfect to the next day being, you know, down and out. So it was kind of like a really cool experience to be there and basically, you know, break bread with people that were basically very, you know, down and out, but it wasn't their choice. That's the whole thing. You know, most people just assume because, oh, these guys just want to drink and be homeless. Because, well, most of the people I met didn't really choose to do that. It was more about the hurricane coming in, the oil spill. So things all of a sudden, you're working 40 hours a week, and all of a sudden they cut your hours to 20. Well, guess what? It's kind of hard to live on half the pay. So there are a lot of things that I learned about, you know, a part of the country where people kind of forgotten about it. You know, so I've stayed in touch with the charities. Uh, I have done a lot of different things for them and basically used my resources to bring awareness. So the show really did a lot of good for three great, you know, people and also the charities that were in, you know, Mobile, Alabama, and really helped them out. So it's, you know, helped them basically do more for the people that are down there. That's amazing. Well, Debbie has a follow-up question. Hey, Wing, big fan of Wahoos. Love what you're doing for the community. How have you leveraged your own personal brand for building Wahoo success? I'm an entrepreneur, and I've been constantly told by my advisors that I'm a great speaker. I have some great value for people, (laughs) and I should use more of my public speaking and stuff to get my name out there. Well, it kind of goes hand in hand. The more people believe in what you do, the more they're going to support the business you happen to be in. So it kind of goes hand in hand because obviously they see that the more they're able to support your business, the more you're going to be able to do in the community. So you don't do it because you're going to, oh, I'm going to go speak so then I can get 10 more people in my stores. You do it because, hey, it's fun to share and it's fun to inspire other people. The benefit of that doing that is people get inspired and they're like hey wing is such a good guy maybe if i support wahoos more uh maybe they will do more in the community so it kind of feeds on itself but you don't start by saying hey i'm going to do this because i can get 10 more bodies in my store okay okay this next question is from daniel hey wing what is the number one cause that means the most to you wow it's a hard line well you know, it's, it's a, that is a very, very tough question to answer because there are so many great causes close to me, right? In terms of, you know, the homeless shelters, the, you know, abused kids, and then obviously all the, you know, the diseases that are out there from ALS, MDA. I mean, I go through almost every acronym under the sun. So to me, it's more about where can I have... Uh, the most impact, where can I influence, where can I raise the most money, and basically try to, you know, uh, find a cure or end something like I.E. homelessness in Orange County. So to me, it's like it's very hard. I only sit on a few boards because they absolutely twisted my arm to do it. Otherwise, I'd rather not, and I'd rather be an independent where I can really help everybody out. And to me, it's like, hey, as long as I'm having fun, I'm going to use leverage our brand, rope in our vendors, rope in our friends to say, hey, if we can pull our resources together, I think we can make a difference. Uh, the most recent charity that I had a lot of fun with is because my wife just joined the board of, uh, let's see, Project Hope Alliance. And again, you don't realize, you know, how many families are in need in Orange County. So I'm helping her out as much as I can. You know, she's leading the charge and she's got some great, you know, uh, board members that are all working together. So that's a lot of fun for me to help, uh, you know, other what I call smaller charities get more notoriety, more notoriety and raise more money. Okay, that's amazing. Well, coincidentally, this next person's name is Kelly, so that's interesting. <laughs> um, Kelly has a question. Hey, Wing, love going to Wahoos every week. I go there with my family. I'm just curious, have you ever thought about doing other similar businesses such as a food truck or a fusion-type <laughs> restaurant? 
you know, you dream about all that, but stick to the core. We do happen to have a food truck that we use for special events. As a matter of fact, as soon as I get off this phone, I'll be jumping in the truck and helping feed a bunch of, you know, businesses around one of our offices. Offices, so I do enjoy driving the truck around and uh, doing all kinds of what I call R and D while I'm doing it. But it's been a fun mobile kitchen to use for charity events for us. But in terms of doing any other concept, uh, love to help other people out. But I'm sticking to my core, which is making great fish tacos. Awesome. Okay. Well, I don't. I, one last question. Uh, the other two went off. Uh, Corey has. Hey, Wing, love what you're doing with Wahoos again. What do you think you would do differently if you wanted to become an entrepreneur right now? Right now, I would basically say, you know what, figure it out how, you know, like you see this whole new movement with the food trucks. They they were basically launched because they figured out how to use Twitter, right? So I would say that any new business that you're going to try to launch, if you can figure out how you can leverage social media, you're going to be able to be – successful a lot quicker than I did because, again, the power of sharing knowledge and, uh, you know, the word of mouth on steroids, which is social media. So I think if you've got a great idea and you can use the social media to leverage, you know, the launch of it, I think you have a, a much better chance of being successful a lot quicker than me. Instead of taking 26 years to become a brand, you could become a brand overnight. Okay. Okay. Well, on that note, Wing, really appreciate you being on the show. I love what you're doing for the community. Um, you know, one final question I have for you is I seen this trend where the more successful people are, the more they give back. Um, you not only give back to nonprofits, you now help startups. Like we have our common friend, Jeff with my open road, you doing things for all these different athletes. Um, what, why do you think you give back more as you become more successful? Just curious. Well, because, you know, the more resources you have, you know, the more, the bigger your network is, the weirder it becomes because it, I always tell people this, be, be, be careful with what you wish for because I know the most random people that I shouldn't. And that's literally almost every day something great happens and you just put that in the bank account, right? Because it's not that I'm going to need that resource. I know people that will. So it's just one of those things where the more people you meet, the bigger your network becomes, the more people you can help. It's just one of those things that just feeds on itself. So the paying forward is it's amazing that at the most random time, right, somebody will give something back to you that is so unexpected. But it only happens because you just keep building this crazy network. So, I mean, I can tell you amazing stories about things that have happened to me in the last five years and all totally, totally random and it's all because, again, building the network. So the more you give, as stupid as it sounds, the more you're going to give back. Okay. I love that. I love that. Well, Wing, thank you so much for being on the show. And more importantly, thank you for helping make our society be a better place, not only with your own example, but also with um, the great guidance that you give to many other people. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Go eat more fish tacos, and I'm going to go back and jump in on my own taco truck. <laughs> Awesome, man. Have a good day. All right. You too, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.